Uh, it became a business where they were bringing in millions of pounds of Thai, Mexican, and hash. They were bringing them in ships, they were dropping off 100,000 pounds in Seattle, 100,000 pounds in, in uh, Eugene, off the coast, uh, hit, hit where we are, San Francisco, uh, all the way down, Santa Barbara, and then the ships would go. Well, they would bring those loads in, they would unload them. Four people or five would get 20, 25,000 pounds, people would get four or 5,000. I was like the youngest guy getting 1,000 pounds at a time. And back then, that was the early 80s, and late 70s, that was like a million to five million dollars. On fronts, handshakes, no deposits, no anything. So you guys are young. In 1970, a man working as an electrician could have a house, three kids, a wife, no debt, have the boat, and have a property in the mountains. Okay, that's gone. There's none of that. Now you got two people working, they can't have half that. Okay, they just took it out from under us. Well, I mean, to me, it's serving people. That's what God wants us to do, is serve people. You know, what was Christ? What was Buddha? You know, so the most beautiful thing in the world is unconditional love and service. Compassion for all sentient beings. You know, Omani Padme Yeah. That's really what it is. That's what we're here for. This is a big school. And when you get pure enough, you get to graduate. Even though someone's opinion may contradict yours. Where's my friend Alan? It's all about your perspective. Who are we? And what is the nature of this reality? What's up, everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. We are on site at the beautiful New West Summit. We are now going to be talking to Tim Blake. Hi, Tim. Hey, glad to see you. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Really appreciate it. It's a pleasure. Tim's background's epic. He's the founder and producer of the Emerald Cup, which is the world's largest outdoor organic cannabis competition. And he did that 16 years ago. He also earned his real estate license at the age of 19. He's been founding and CEO of several production companies in the mm -hmm. 1980s. Uh, so many other things on this list. A founding member of the California Cannabis Reform Policy, CCPR. Yeah. There's a lot to dive into here. Tim, let's start things off by asking you about how did you get fascinated with this at your youth? And tell, take us through your journey. Oh, cannabis. Um, well, my um, family lived in the Bay Area, San Jose, Sunnyvale. I have uh, six brothers and sisters, uh, traditional middle-class family, you know, Catholic family. And uh, I was a hyperactive kid, extremely hyper. And so uh, in grammar school, I had uh, one of the Hispanic kids had some cannabis. And uh, I didn't get high the first couple of times, but I think seventh grade, sixth grade, seventh grade. And the second or third time I did, and it was a really amazing experience. So that opened me up to the whole thing. Unfortunately, he moved away, wasn't anymore around, it kind of stopped. We moved over to, to Santa Cruz or Capitola right next to Santa Cruz with my whole family when I was uh, going into high school. And so now we moved from San Jose, you know, liberal suburban place to the belly of the most liberal place in the country, which is Santa Cruz outside of San Francisco. So now we go over there to this place right downtown. There's a three-story building. I'm living in the old keg room in the bar down below. I got a pool table, the keg room, the uh, black lights go up, everything's really cool, I have a fun thing going on. My parents start smoking all this cannabis with all the art community, which was part of Capitol at the time. I mean, it was very, very liberal. And so I'm basically stealing my dad's pot, getting pot from people, you know, coming through the, all the people local. And I started smoking a lot of cannabis uh, and realizing that for me, being a very hyperactive kid, it kept me off riddle and it kept me, it really balanced me, uh, very, very much so. At the same time, I realized some of the largest dealers in town, which were only in their 20s, uh, were selling cannabis, and I got to know these guys, and they started selling me, you know, back then it was uh, kilos, 2.2s, bricks, you know, 2.2 pounds. And so I would get 2.2 pounds, which was 32 ounces is 2 pounds, plus the 0.2, which would be a few extra ounces, and we'd smoke the extra ounces and sell the 32, and I'd go to high school. My hair was all the way down to my back. Uh, it evolved very quickly. Uh, I had a, my mom and I had a dog named Hashish, Hash for short, and all of a sudden I was like in the middle of Capitol and Santa Cruz's burgeoning wild liberal scene of the early 70s. And uh, it was an amazing place to be in. So I was doing that and at the same time I started taking up translal meditation. Mm. So I was doing translal meditation and cannabis, uh, 16, 17 year old, you know, selling, selling butt on the side every day of the week. And uh, all of a sudden I had the uh, opportunity to kind of grow that business. 
uh, these guys got big really quick. Um, now you got to remember, people don't remember, but the way it worked was it was a very organic scene with a bunch of hippies and Vietnam vets and stuff bringing people back, cannabis from South America or Vietnam or Asia. That was very organic. Well, in the mid-70s, that very quickly formed into a huge business. And between 1975, 76, 77, all the way till they changed the minimum mandatories in, I think, 87, uh, it became a business where they were bringing in millions of pounds of Thai, Mexican, and hash. They were bringing them in ships. They were dropping off 100,000 pounds in Seattle, 100,000 pounds in, in uh, Eugene, off the coast, uh, hit, hit where we are, San Francisco, uh, all the way down, Santa Barbara, and then the ships would go. Well, they would bring those loads in. They would unload them. Four people or five would get 20, 25,000 pounds. People would get four or 5,000. I was like the youngest guy getting 1,000 pounds at a time. And back then, that was the early 80s, in the late 70s. That was like a million to five million dollars. On fronts, handshakes, no deposits, no anything. And it was all well run, you made your money, it was all clean, there were no robberies, it was integrity based. It was a, it was a really wonderful time actually. I did, I did really well back then. And I actually got to the point where I was getting 5,000 pound loads, uh, which was for my age almost unheard of. They actually asked me how I was doing it uh, because I wasn't getting the prices. They were wondering how I was selling that. And I was saying, well, in all each thousand pounds, they'd have about 50 pounds of these A++ bricks, and uh, like the red ones or the golds. And so I would basically sell the 5,000 pounds for cost. I'd just wholesale it, and then just take out those 250 pounds of those A graders and give them all to my small people. So my small people had all the best bud in the Bay Area. And so I'd make a couple extra bucks. They'd, they'd be like the hit of the, the whole town. And so I built this whole business with that. And uh, that's, that's how kind of wow. went through the uh, early 80s. And then, uh, wow. and then a friend of mine showed up one day, one of the dealers, and he said, here, I got this stuff. And it was the finest cannabis I'd ever seen. It was called the Chronic, the Grease, the Magic. That's what it became known as. It wasn't known at the time. It was the furriest, whitest bud I'd ever seen. Strongest stuff, but probably better than anything today. And the big Sir Holy people put it together. And he said, you see this? We're going to all be growing under those lights that you see in Safeway within two years. And uh, I was like, I had a thousand pounds in my backyard. I'm like, you're, you're out of your mind. Why are we going to grow under lights in a safe way? He said, that's because they're going to bust all the loads. The generals have already talked about it. They're going to bust all the loads in the next two years, and they're going to take it all out, and you're not going to be able to get cannabis anymore. And I was like, you're crazy. I said, I'll buy all your pot. But he wanted me to give me a third of, a, third of every crop for six crops, and uh, I couldn't give one clone away. And uh, I was like, you're out of your mind, dude. I'm just, just. Uh, a year and a half later, I went back and begged for that clone. They busted 12 loads. You can go back historically and look at the news. They busted about 12 loads in a row. Everybody realized it was over. The DA came in. And he added something to it. At the time, people in uh, you know, the poor areas, Oakland, San Francisco, everywhere, uh, the, the people in the streets, you know, Afro-Americans, they were all getting a lot of bud. They weren't doing crack. Okay? Within that two-year period, they couldn't get any bud, but they could get $10 grams of crack. And they just turned the whole thing upside down, just, just turned it on us, like overnight. That was predicted by the people in the business. They said that was going to happen. I watched it happen. I got damaged 1980 by what year? Probably started in, uh, in 85, 86. I can go back and look. Between 85 and 87 when it started. You got the, the elements of the bus started. I think they probably started coming in probably 86. We heard about it 86 to 88. You know, by 89, it was totally dry. Everybody was making runs to Arizona to try to bring back something border back there. It was nobody could get anything. That's why all this indoor and outdoor blew up. There was a little bit of it going on, of course, but not much, because there wasn't any need for it. You were you know, bringing millions of pounds a year of Thai and Mexican in. It was a forcing function of the indoor and outdoor flourishing of California it came from the stopping of the importing from Mexico. Mostly from Thailand. From what you Th have, what Thailand you was growing more, most of this? Well, yeah, what happened was is that people don't even remember this, but uh, there were, they were called the, uh, the sticks, Thai sticks. They were a famous thing. They wrapped Thai on a stick. And the reason why they did it was because it wasn't that good, so they could take a whole bud and kind of bend it over and wrap it on a stick, and they'd sell it to you. So when they first started coming in, they were these Thai stick pounds. Okay? Well, then they quickly realized in Judy, well, if we don't put it on a stick, and we lay it in nice and light and do a, fr a little light press on it, you can get these two packs of beautiful Thai buds that just pull right off, and they're beautiful, stunning, almost rounded, beautiful bud. And so the ingen ingenuity of American wherewithal was we got taken out with all those loads down south, so people started blowing up uh, all the indoor and outdoor because that went away. 
but for about 10 years from the late 70s to that period, it became something where these two packs came in, and that's what they were called. They were called two packs. They weren't 2.2s the way the, the Mexican pounds were. They were just two packs. They'd come in between 900 and 1,000 grams, and uh, they became. You get the you get the reds and the almost the purples, the, the goldens, and they were just an unbelievable, phenomenal, you know, material. And that's what we lived off, and it was really. Uh, it was really an amazing industry. It was a fun thing to be part of. You were a entrepreneur from the age of fifteen. Fifteen, just building up a like a a, a massive network of people that were then uh, distributing cannabis across the Bay Area. It was. It was. Uh, it became pretty big. I probably had 25, 30 guys working for me. Uh, you and know, like, well, you know. like you said, as soon as that uh, got, you had so many interesting nuances of taking this best stuff and distributing at cost to the distribution network, mm -hmm. which then made it so that they kept as like the top dog, so that that's why you were so young and able to get a thousand pounds at a time. Uh, and that's crazy even thinking about what a thousand pounds looks like. That's like this whole room filled with cannabis. Um, that kind of stuff's nuts. And so then, you know, how were you, you know, moving that in what, like a, like in a, in an actual yeah. like U-Haul big truck over to your, you know, and doing this distribution process. And then you also taught about how the flip of like when the, when the, it gets choked out cannabis in the Bay Area, people flip over to uh, using crack. Um, That's what they pushed it into. They put, well, cocaine. I mean, the high-end people were doing cocaine. And they gave it to a lot of us. All of a sudden, cocaine became, you know, we all, I mean, a lot of us tried it for a very short period and realized what a toxic nightmare that was. Uh, but they didn't take up much room. You're looking at two packs that, you know, pressed, you know, buds about that long. You could have, you know, a pack about that thick and about that long to be a two-pack. So you could stack those against the wall and you could have, you know, 100 pounds almost right there. I mean, this little thing right here, you could have quite a bit. It didn't take big, big trucks. Didn't take big uh, trucks. No, no. And then I'd break it all down. Everybody'd get between 50 and 100 pounds. I had, you know, I had 20 people getting 50 to 100 pounds. Yeah. And they were going out and doing their thing. And someone else above you was getting 25,000. Well, they were getting 5,000 above me, and then 20 to 25 above that. So what I was doing was I was going to the people that were getting, like maybe 20,000 pounds, but they couldn't sell it all. So I was wholesaling that for them Gosh. to help them out. And I wasn't making any money, but I was making those those high graders. So I did. I'd make like five bucks on those. Well, I get I would get 250 of those things, make five bucks a piece. That's 125 grand. This is crazy. So in the early 80s, Thailand was manu was making and shipping uh, hundreds of thousands of pounds. Millions. Of, now it didn't. It got millions yeah, it of got, pounds. Yeah, it got uh, grown in other places. It became uh, throughout Asia. You know, I don't know if they were all growing at all in Thailand, but it became Americans going over there and building really massive businesses. And you know, Americans you went there and built the actual oh, they cannabis built, farms. Well, they, they, they put it all together. Yeah, it was basically just hippies or stoner business kids and stuff that just realized what the strains and what they had, what they could do, what they could build, how easy it was. There wasn't any DEA, so there was no really getting busted with the shipping yet. That DEA didn't come in until about Drug Enforcement Agency, for people who don't know that. Yeah. That didn't come in until the mid-80s when they brought in the minimum mandatories. They said, okay, this is how we're going to get rid of that. And uh, they said, we're going to bring the minimum mandatories, which meant if you had over 1,000 pounds, it was like a minimum. You couldn't change it like a 10-year prison sentence. I had a guy that came up with the last load It was uh, that we were part of. It was about 6,700 pounds. Uh, he brought it up. He was going to see my friend, and then I was going to see him. And he went into the mountains. They'd followed him all the way out of the Sierras. And uh, they didn't know where he was going in the Santa Cruz Mountains because they hadn't used phones. And back then, they didn't have the phone technologies and stuff. And so they busted him before he got there. Now, people put up 250000 for that guy, and he did six months in county jail in, in uh, Milpitas. Okay, a year later, that was a 15-year prison sentence. Man, minimum, minimum mandatory. mandatory 15, 15 prison. And so then they got people to roll on each other. They'd bust people, and it'd be like, okay, you're not going to just get 250000 and go to Milpitas for six months. Now you're going to go to jail for 20 years. Are you going to start rolling on people? In fact, I remember the, um, the last real load of international smuggled stuff came in. It was 23,000 pound, 23, pounds of hash. I think it was 1990, uh, right in there. And uh, I wasn't part of it, but I knew the family that did the whole thing. And uh, they brought it in. They'd paid $50,000 a piece to about 20 guys to bring it offshore, who'd all been paid. They stored it. They had a giant party. 
it was like a celebration. It was a who's who of the cannabis world. Uh, we sat down at the party. I was with this guy. We had Skinny, Fatty, some of these names we had back then. And I said, you know what, dude? You look around. This is like a who's who, who's left of the industry. And you guys brought it in. You know, they were celebrating and stuff. They spent a bank on that party. And then three months later, they took them all out because they, f they, got, um, they got the captain on it. So they hadn't sold anything. And he went back to all the, the guys and said, you got to give me back the 50000 apiece because I need the million dollars to defend myself. And uh, these knuckleheads didn't do it. They all had their families and their people, and they thought, OK, this is it. We're going to keep our money, and that's the way it goes, blah, blah, blah. Well, he looked at 15, 20 years, and they said they'd give him five if he took them all out. So he took all 22 of them out. And uh, I'm not saying he was right. That's just facts. And so they all did four and a half years. Oh and for those God. guys holding on to that 50 grand apiece, they all went to prison. And uh, he did four and a half rather than 20. And uh, I mean, it was his deal. He should have done the time. Uh, it's just the story, the way it went. And so that was really the end of it for me, too. Uh, there was a couple little things. I got busted. I got busted with some of the only time Mexican left in, in the state. Uh, well, I, I didn't get busted with it, actually. I was turned in by my son, former son-in-law. Well, whenever we talk to, like, uh, you know, like Steve yeah. D'Angelo on our show and stuff, he always t teaches us about this, this several decade long uh, strenuous process that so many people had to go through, including these multi-year uh, prison sentences mm -hmm. um, and uh, just like what happens when people flip from cannabis to harder um, substances and due to those choke points and stuff like that that happen um, along this journey. It's just such a complicated uh, evolutionary process that happened with bringing cannabis back to the light that indigenous people have been using for thousands of years prior to this. And so it's kind of like a, a big, and how it created this forcing function too in California. You know, if, if it didn't come in, if the DEA in 85 didn't come in to, to do this choke on it, um, it, you called it Thai Mexican, it could have continued going that in that direction where those economies could have flourished and the California economy of cannabis might have actually just continued purchasing from over there instead of doing it natively here. So in a sense, it could be a, 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 a gift in disguise that... Uh, it was. It was. Well, you know, in, in uh, Chinese mythology and stuff, crisis equals opportunity, it has the opposite. So that crisis was our opportunity. So it, you're right. That did make our markets blow up because we were blowing up Asia and South America. And so it's an amazing thing the way that went. How is so, that? That's such a weird well, there's a karmic thing. Karmic there. thing yeah, it blew up in the DEA's face. They thought they were going to suppress us. And what they did was we just popped out and went sideways all over. Or them. maybe there's something above the DEA that said that you go stop that so that our native markets can blow up. Um, so there's all different kinds of theories that could potentially spur from that. Yeah, yeah well, if you want to get up into the spiritual realm, I think karmically yeah. it was more uh, destined that it was going to go this way so that we would take back that and we would have this legalization effort that really spearheaded the whole world. And so I think that's what happened. Because, because you think that South America or South Asia wouldn't be able to spearhead a legalization uh, potentially, something like that. They wouldn't have done it like what we went through. There was, uh, we had to go through this karmic war uh, this battle over the last 40 years uh, to really fight this because when you really because the down West has enough of the of the, the voice and the Constitution and these types of things that are based on um, you know free speech and and enough about uh, mm -hmm. the po powers of of uh, of of of, uh, of getting a, a rightful trial and all these other kinds of things that. Uh, that maybe make it more possible for with freedoms to achieve what you were just describing as karmically destined to achieve. Yeah, well, look what we fund. That's why they hated us so much was because we fund Greenpeace, all the alternative movements. You know, we're liberal. We're open to you know all doctrines, all faiths, all sexualities. It's like we were a very because we're outlaws. You know, so it was like there's little judgment. And you know, I mean, you've heard about University of Mississippi, all the studies they did down mm -hmm. there. Okay, well. When Israel and the rest of the world started actually testing cannabis, it only took them about 20 years for them to really realize the medicinal aspects, discover all that, and really move it, okay? Well, the University of Mississippi started working on that 10 or 15 years before the Israelis. They knew all of this. They knew every bit of this. And I've said, I don't care, because I don't care about putting people in prison and going back to that. It's just too late for that. But my mom died. I have all kinds of family members that died of cancer or different things that could have been healed with cannabis. 
And they kept that from us, knowing at some point they knew the medicinal benefits of it, and that was a crime against humanity. Because at that point, they were mm. withholding something that was a proven thing to them to heal people of epilepsy, of cancer, of different you know, illnesses. So they probably knew that uh, 10, 15 years before the Israelis. And what they did was they decided to really suppress it because they didn't want us to thrive. We were talking about it earlier, that thriving thing. They also realized, OK, look at the building materials that you can make out of hemp. Look at the crete. Look at the clothing. Look at everything. It was a renewable resource. Yeah. But it doesn't work with their you know, always recycling and making you buy more and throwing it away. We're not a, it used to be, I grew up with Sears. We went to get a Sears Craftsman tool and it lasts for 20 years. You get a Kenmore or anything. We don't live, we're a Kmart, Walmart, everything breaks within one year. And it all just gets replaced and recycled, just like we are. We're just fed toxic food, toxic air, toxic drugs, and then we're just spit out, sucked dry, and then we're just regenerated. And that's what they created as a world for us that wasn't thriving. And cannabis was a major part of that because they realized we'd really thrive. And when they let cannabis out and started healing all these people and started making them not drink or do hard drugs, and then we could start using all these reusable products, what was that going to mean for them? Interesting. And so okay. that's what it was. Whoa. Okay. So let's, um, let, there's obviously a lot of other stuff that we can talk about, but I think what you're talking about right now is important to keep our, um, let's keep our attention on that. So, uh, okay. So there's a lot of, uh, of, of economic and political um, and social forces that push for a very specific way that humanity functions where it can be squeeze out a human like an orange into the machinery for the profits to funnel up for only a specific amount of people and then just have them die uh, uh, and then just cycle into the next person filling that role in the machinery, squeeze it out again versus the uh, which feeds into that consumptive uh, conspicuous cycle of, 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 uh, of materialism and stuff like that that again benefits where does the money funnel into versus a method that is geared towards a holistic uh, uh, sustainable uh, a longer term like you were saying getting something that lasts 20 years instead of one things like that so Let's talk about your uh, knowledge about that. That sounds like it's very fascinating. I would love to dive deeper into that. Well, we do regenerative farming at the Emerald Cup because we have to teach people how to regenerate their farms. We strip the topsoil off everything across this country. Um, it, you know, you talk about uh, in integrity. That's what our panel was today. Okay, uh, cannabis people were integrity based because it was handshakes, it was word of mouth, it was trust. Uh, it used to be that's what a Sears was. It was about based on every, every company in America was built. A Ford. Everybody had great great products. Okay, when they decided, it's a bigger piece of the onion, but when they decided peeling the onion back to not have us thrive, and it was like, okay, we're gonna have to take away uh, the sustainability of this place, specifically America, because what they did here was, when they took us onto the gold standard, off the gold standard onto the uh, oil standard in 1972, whatever they did, we went from zero debt to 30 trillion in 40 years, or whatever, 50 years, almost. and. They basically bankrupted this country, which, which would have taken probably two or three hundred years to do. For us to have become Rome would have taken two or three hundred years. They brought us to almost third world country status within 40 or 50 because they needed to bring us to their knees, bring us to our knees so they could basically dominate us because we were not going to be very controllable like the rest of the world. So they got together and said, okay, you make toxic food, you make toxic drugs, you ruin the water systems, you make the laws that destroy these people. You know, you bring in all the drugs from Asia and stuff while the pharmaceuticals kill them off, and we're just going to basically wipe these people out and dummy them down to where they're basically not very intelligent, they're very slow thinking, they're sick all the time, and we can control them. You know, almost like the Matrix, we'll just feed off them and spit them out. And so that's what they've done. And look Who's at they? Well, you can call them the New World Order, Deep State, uh, you can call them whatever name you want to call them. You know, I, I don't care what the name is, but basically the people that run this world that, you know, if you go back, what did they do in the 30s? You know, the Bush family came in, they created the Federal Reserve and the IRS. That was to start the taxation of us. They didn't even put taxation above any number because they never thought they'd tax us more than 2%. 2%, the average person's taxed 30 to 40 now. They were thinking that 2% would be so radical they didn't have to put a, a lid on it, okay? But that's because they were gonna create the Federal Reserve, take our money to supply away from us and bring us to our knees. I don't think at that point they were thinking about killing us all. I don't, I don't think they were really, I think they were just going to dominate us, you know, financially. Then as they got going and they started realizing a lot of stuff that was happening, 
Um, I was told and read a paper that they did a study, scientific study in the late 50s, projecting what it'd be like at 2010. And they said it'd be overpopulated, uh, hard to control people, hard to teach them uh, to not procreate and do all these things, and that they had two choices, either to really do a massive educational drive and try to stop all this, or to basically figure out how to get rid of 90% of the people. And that's what they did. They created a program to basically rid this world of about 90% of the people. And uh, What is were, that program? What are the well, core pillars were, of it? No, the pillars of it? <laughs> basically, uh, the vaccines that they do, they toxify us, all the pharmaceuticals, all the stuff that they give us as children to basically weaken us, to so weaken our immune systems, all the food that basically just poisons us, down to the water, the fluoride. I mean, I can go 40 chemtrails. You can just go right through everything. You know, the average person wears a cotton shirt that's that's uh, grown or inorganically, you can test the chemicals coming onto your body until you wash it four times. Okay, they know that. And so everybody walking around today gets a new thing from Kmart, and four washes, they're just soaking toxins into their body. Every way you could think of, they did. And they were masters at it, and they did it so subtly that we didn't see it. You know, it's kind of like the frog in the, in the pot didn't realize it. Mm -hmm. The average person in 1970, uh, today, in working in a fast food place, would be making $37 an hour. So you guys are young. In 1970, a man working as an electrician could have a house, three kids, a wife, no debt, have the boat, and have a property in the mountains. Okay, that's gone. There's none of that. Now you got two people working, they can't have half that. Okay, they just took it out from under us. Okay, it's, it's a masterful job. When you watch what they did and you see it, it's like, actually for me, it's like being in the matrix. I mean, I look around and- For realize, us too. For yeah. the young ones are starting to pick it up too. Yeah, well you realize this is all fake. I mean, it's like, I'm not, I didn't vote for Trump or uh, Trump or Clinton. They're all phony. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, there, it's all part of the whole thing. It's just what they did to build this, to dupe us. You know, and, th and that's what they did. They did a masterful job at it. Just a masterful job. So, so would it be fair to say that there was um, some sort of, of um, conscious ascension that was happening in the United States and that there needed to be a control um, mechanism that was implemented in order to make it so that the ascension wouldn't um, uh, cause a greater awakening and rather to be suppressed in ways. And then it was the distribution of the suppression across mm -hmm. so many ways that are um, in, seemingly invisible. Um, but yet at the same time, people argue, oh my God, I have the, the look at these computers, they're so incredible, or I have mm -hmm. Um, the fastest way of communicating with people now around the world or uh, I can now get this um, this incredible uh, the pro process of mapping my body so that I can get rid of a pathology now uh, uh -huh. uh, and so so there are all these arguments that that we um, have so much uh, better uh, you know standards or qualities of a love life but it's also a big question of who is in control uh, and what is in control is it necessarily just the human or is there something controlling the human as life feeds on life as above so below yeah well that's a fascinating place to go because they saw the 60s come in and they were going to stop that in its tracks they weren't going to let that happen that's why they devised how to get that out of there and bring cocaine in and they put in their laboratories figured out what crack was we're going to make super cocaine and they did that because they had to derail that consciousness that was blossoming and the interesting thing was is they they cut the plant back to the root, but anybody knows with most things that root will still grow and get stronger and then have more to push out. And so what they did was they killed it all the way back, but now look at it 40 years later, look at the psychedelic research that's coming in and coming back. Look at what cannabis has done. No matter what they did, it backfired on them and just blew up in their face. And so it really, uh, they, I think they almost pulled it off. I think they came very close to pulling it off, but um, it didn't work and now we're basically faced with these people that rule the world that realize it's not working, they're not gonna be able to finish us off, they're not gonna control this the way they went. You don't it's speak kinda, too soon, we have uh, artificial intelligence and robotics that are coming, say, yeah, which you do. 5G technology, there's a yeah. lot of things that are oh, coming no. that we are, uh, neuroprosthetics, there's lots I of understand. interesting things coming that people well, that's the next way. these are great, they're gonna absolutely benefit us in every way possible, mm -hmm. which has a lot of upside potential, but it also has the other potential of wiping out those 90% uh, uh, 
that you were mentioning a little bit earlier too. Well, yeah, they're using 5G that they're gonna toxify us more. All the cell phones ruin your brains. I mean, they, they this stuff, I mean, would you rather be in 1970 and have a, a wife and two kids and be able to go to the lake every weekend and have no debt and have no stress and see with your kids every night? Or would you rather have all these toys and all this phony stuff and be debt ridden and be driven crazy and hate your wife and be divorced and living in an apartment? I mean, people can pick what they wanted. That was a better life. We didn't get a better life. That was a better life. A simple life was much better, wholesome. People weren't sick and they were doing a great job. Now, AI is gonna be the next thing. Elon Musk and everybody knows that AI, they're going to get smart enough to where they can do a lot of stuff. And I, I would say, once we rid the planet of this dominating conscious personality that's trying to take it all away from us, then we have the chance for the meek to inherit the earth. I mean, the next challenge behind that, I think, would be AI. But the space like family- Like to potentially democratize mm -hmm. the benefits mm -hmm. um, of, of the planet to more mm -hmm. people to uh, have the creative flourishing, the conscious ascension happen around the world rather than just concentrated into the thing. People kept saying that about the internet as well. The internet's gonna do that as well, the enable mm -hmm. this conscious ascension. So a lot of it, blockchain technology, all these things keep coming, cannabis keeps, you know, all these things keep coming and the idea is that can you make it so that the fruits are shared widely and mm -hmm. enable the um, this future utopic, more utopic world that we want to all um, live in, or is it going to again cause economic bifurcations and wealth and all these other types of, yeah. I think that it would have done all of that uh, 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, I don't think that's going to happen. All the stuff I've seen with conspiracy circles and what I've seen happening right now is that's about to end. We're going to have a very, very interesting year ahead. And uh, Why? I think you're going to see uh, free energy systems coming out and being announced over the next couple of years. Oh, uh, it's in the pendulum swings into uh, yeah, free. Yeah, into, into freeing, into them backing up and all of a sudden, okay, well, I guess we'll just, there's 28 patented free energy systems, we're going to have to let that go now. And we're going to have to let the ability to produce food uh, much more efficiently so that we can actually have people eat right. And, uh, you know, it's going to come down, I think a lot of it's going to do with space. I think really, um, say what you want about Trump, uh, but if you look at a couple things, he formed the uh, Space Force about a year ago. People were laughing at him, and they're they're mocking him and stuff. So then about no, it's it's so no, it's later, no stupid move. It's no, well, no stupid months move. later. Yeah, then he yeah. formed the Space Command, and they said what's and then he put all the military under the Space Command, and he's done this in waves where now all the military is under the Space Command. Okay, and then, what is the Space Command? Well, that's he says it to the public. That's because we're doing so much in outer space, and they're thinking, oh, we're launching some satellites, and he's like, no, 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 we're like way beyond that. Yeah. I mean, my, my ultimate thing, uh, since I'm a little kid. So like, isn't it the first ones that go to the next rocks or the ones that get to pick the rules that govern those rocks? Well, I think it's even, yeah, it's way bigger than that is where it goes for it. Because I've been, I've been studying UFOs since I was a kid. I've been interacting with UFOs. Area 101 has a billboard with the UFO landing in the forest uh, because of where I've, I've been. I've had many, many interactions with UFOs. Uh, I've had many people see them with me. Uh, I've been dealing with them since I was a kid. It's what I, since I was a little kid, I wanted to be the intermediary between our space family and humankind. Um, I started studying that when I was really young. Uh, I've learned a lot over the last few years, a lot of people coming forward, and uh, I really learned what the real story, which is, is just so, so deep and so strong that people just are gonna, they're gonna really be in for a shock of what, when they really find out what has happened in our world for the last or 90 years. When the real sort of, does it feel like it's this light and dark that are pressing? Oh, it's coming right up against it. Against, and oh, then, no, and, and there's an ascension that's it, happening with. That's what, that's what's happening. With them both. With them both. Basically, that's what you're, you, I don't know if you're familiar with the Law of One, one of the books out there, if you get into Ra, uh, which I had a hard time. I wasn't even really into that for a long time. But if you look at, you know, it's yin and yang, whatever else. I mean, there's fourth dimensional evil and there's fourth dimensional goodness too, because it all goes up together. Um, but. You know, basically when the Germans uh, were, you know, they were working with psych. If you go back and you can look at it, the Vril Society, uh, Maria, I forget her name, but she was a famous psychic medium. And she was channeling these Andromedans who were teaching her how to build spacecraft or be able to, to move through space. And the Nazis heard about it, the Germans heard about it, and uh, came and researched it all and realized that it actually was very valid. And um, 
started working with that energy and actually built spacecrafts that were working and functioning. At the end of the World War II, if you look at it, if you go back and look in history, they talked about unleashing the, the powerful, most powerful weapon in the world that would stop us. But the inside Nazis decided that they weren't going to sacrifice, they would rather sacrifice World War II and continue on with what they were doing. So they moved it all to Antarctica. And if you go research, you'll see my age people always wondered, why were all these Germans down in Argentina? In Chile and South America. It seems like they all went down there. They were capturing or whatever else. That's because it was a jumping spot to Antarctica where they could work back and forth and do their ships. And then you go back, uh, if you remember the famous photo with the UFOs over Washington, the White House? You ever seen that? No? You haven't? Okay. Well, go look up famous UFO sighting with the photo over the White House. It was on national television. These ships go over the White House. And, and it was, because back then they weren't so afraid of saying it. This was uh, before Dwight, and during Dwight Eisenhower's uh, era. Washington, D.C. UFO incident in 1952? Or uh, White House, White House UFO uh, flyover, or one of them, and see what pops up. Now, they whitewashed a lot off the internet, so a lot of the stuff you've got to go find through other researchers. I have pictures of it, I can send you a book of the whole thing. It's a very famous thing. Now, most people thought that was UFO. In the UFO conspiracy circle, we thought that was UFOs. Right? Well, it turns out that was the German ships that came over and checkmated us and said, you can't stop us. We went through all of your, your radar, all your military stuff. There's nothing you can do. And then he negotiated a deal with Dwight Eisenhower. And that's when Dwight Eisenhower made that famous speech about beware of the industrial military complex because we made a deal with those people to go in partnership. And that's when he told John F. Kennedy and that's when they killed Kennedy for him trying to stop it, and that was the end of our democracy as we know it. Okay, and so what we did was... Who is they made a deal with Dwight Eisenhower? Basically, Dwight Eisenhower and our military, he himself was part of it and got together with this, uh, this German group and basically made a deal to surrender in a sense, but in doing that, wouldn't have to give up any sovereignty and they would share technology, because what happens was the Germans are down there in Antarctica. They have the space technology, they have it all. How are they going to build it? Where are they going to get the materials? They need the energy of our manufacturing plants, of everything we have to build it to get into space. And so after they checkmated us, Dwight Eisenhower got in with all the original Northrop, uh, Lockheed, Boeing, all those people which became the beginnings of the outer space program, the black ops. That's when it all went black. Well, what happened with Dwight was, he was cut out. That's when they formed Area, Area 51. Well, he wasn't allowed to go in there. After two years, they decided that it was going to be better since presidents were going to change every four years to not keep them in the loop for their own good and for the security of the nation's good. So basically, they, uh, some of this begins with the CIA. Uh, Alan Doles, if you go back, he was the main dude in there. And they Alan basically, Doles. Al Alan Doles, D-U-L-L-E-S. He was... Uh, a lot of these guys were on Majestic 12. Uh, they were the head of the CIA. These are the, all the beginnings of that. And they came in and moved it out so they wouldn't let Dwight in. And that's when he realized he'd lost control of it. Yeah. And he wasn't in charge anymore. And that's when he made that famous speech before he retired. He was like, beware of the military industrial complex because that's all I can tell you is we've lost control of our world. And he told John F. Kennedy, and then they killed Kennedy over it because he tried to stop him. It wasn't about any of the rest of that shit because he came in and threatened them all. And then they basically, so what they're saying is, if you go back and, and uh, study William Tompkins. William, William Tompkins. William Tompkins um, was a uh, genius kid. He went and his dad took him to the Naval Yard uh, in San Diego. And from memory, he designed and crafted wooden sh ships of every one of the ships with all the high tech stuff they did. And he put a display for like a Macy's thing in, in, in downtown or something. And the military got so freaked out, they saw it that they thought he was a spy or something. Who could do this? And they found this 17-year-old kid. And they were like, oh my God, so what did they do? They jumped him into the military and made him the head of the spy program because of his genius technology and I IQ. So he became the head of the Germans, the spy program for us. And what he started coming back with was, these freaking Germans are building these anti-gravity ships and stuff. And they're getting ready to go down to Antarctica and all this. Well, another piece of the puzzle. See, you guys, I, I, I track all this. Uh, Admiral Byrd went down to Antarctica. If you go back and look at it, Admiral Byrd's trip to Antarctica, he went with a, it was going to be a scientific expedition, but it was with the giant military fleet. And he went down to rid those Germans and get them out of there, but they kicked his ass. 
those UFOs came and blew up all of his shit, and he limped back into South America, and then they covered the whole thing up. And everybody remembers it. You can go look at that whole thing and stuff. Uh, and that's when then the Germans flew over us and said, we've had enough of this. And so it became this whole thing. Well, uh, William Tompkins was part of that whole thing. So they jumped him into the space program. He designed the first command center when we went to the moon. And then he was the head of NASA's systems until 1984. Okay, he retired. He wrote a book. Uh, if you really want to see the best copy, the best version, you should get uh, Michael Sala. Say, well, we're, we're going to space. We're already, you know, the last piece I'll tell you just for us and stuff, though, is that William Tompkins uh, worked through Michael Sala. And you can get Michael Sala's book on him as a PhD. And he had interviews with him before he died. He's, he uh, swears that we launched uh, eight mile and a half long spacecraft through the Navy in 1984 to combat the military industrial Nazi Federation. And that basically it's been Star Wars out there ever since 1984 going on. And that those people are dealing with uh, 700 UFO beings and trading uh, stuff all over the universe now. And basically that we're going to be in for an amazing awakening once we're told all this. And it's supposed to happen within the next couple of years. It's all coming. They're preparing us right now for it. So we're going to Basically, this place could become a park. We could manufacture off planet, which they're already doing. They're manufacturing it all off planet anyway. And then we could just take back this world and just be a big park. So that's what you're going to see. <laughs> I'm so excited to dive into this with you on another <laughs> round on the show. There's obviously still so much to unpack. Um, we like asking a couple quick questions on the way out that we sure. ask our guests. Oh, yeah. Do you think we're in a simulation? I've heard lots of that. Um, a simulation, a simulation of God's mind. Mm. You know, I mean, it's all God, and God's playing out every one of us. I mean, it's really hard for me when I really get it, because I, I get it at times, and my ego almost mm. just has a crisis. Because mm -hmm. I realize I'm not real, mm. okay? None of us are real. We're just figments of God's imagination. Mm. Uh, uh, in the, in the um, um, Course in Miracles, they talk about it as God had a thought, and then all this was created, and instantly went back to itself, and we're just playing out the remnants like movie scenes. There's, there's none of this is even real. Um, so that simulation, from that standpoint, it, it's probably true. I don't like to think about it like that because I like my reality. Um, but you know, but the other side of it is I've studied enough that God has said that we're going to be with her forever. We're all going to have our individual souls and stuff. I used to be afraid of enlightenment because I've come very close to stages of enlightenment from so many years. I'm more of a monk than I am a cannabis guy. Mm. Um, I've been meditating twice a day for 40 years. Um, so, um, but I was re really afraid I'd lose that, that part, that fear coming out, but don't go any higher because you're going to lose your identity. Mm. Now I realize, you know what, no, once you lose your ego, you're still there and you get to travel the stars with all of our space family and go everywhere. You just, you're really more God's servant and you're connected to God and you don't have any fear. Yeah. So. I don't think we're in an AI simulation. And no. then what do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? The most beautiful thing in the world? It's just pure service. It's serving people. Mm. I mean, are you talking about a physical thing or what? I mean, to me, it's serving people. That's what God wants us to do is serve people. Mm. You know, what was Christ? What was Buddha? Mm -hmm. You know, so the most beautiful thing in the world is unconditional love and service, compassion for all sentient beings. You know, Omani Padme Yeah. That's really what it is. That's what we're here for. This is a big school. And when you get yeah. pure enough, you get to graduate. <laughs> and until then, you get to keep coming back and learning lessons. I love it. Thank you so much, Jim. Thanks for coming on our show. Really huh. appreciate you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you no so worries. much. Thank you. You guys are Thank both you. very special. You guys are rare. Thank you. Yeah, you're very rare people. Where you come Thank from. You. Thank thoughts. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. We greatly appreciate <laughs> it. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. Let us know what you're thinking. Check out more of the links in the bio to Tim's work. Also, check out more of the links in the bio to New West Summit. Support the organizations, the entrepreneurs, the leaders around the world that you believe in. Support them. Help them grow. You can find our links in the bio below as well. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. We love you very much. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you soon. Peace. Yeah. All right, that's a wrap. Yeah. Wow. A little different than cannabis. We went in a little different direction, wow. but that's okay. Wow, yeah. So, so this is what I want to teach. I'm finishing in three books.